much. Thank you. Please be seated. This is not about me. It's all about him. Oh, praise God. It is so great to be here in Iowa. And I'll tell you, I've learned to love Iowa. I told just like Governor Huckabee. I've been here so many times. I feel like I am half Iowa and half Texan. So uh, it's, you live in beautiful, beautiful country. I've enjoyed driving around this beautiful state and the beautiful people of Iowa. Well, anyway, it is, it is wonderful to be an American. You know, as you heard a minute ago, I was not born in this country. Was born under a very oppressive military dictatorship. So I know what it is to lose freedom. I used to tell my son, I don't know how many times, you know, Ted, when I lost my freedom in Cuba, I had a place to come to. If we lose our freedoms here, where would we go? There is no place to go. And you know, I do have an appreciation for the value of freedom. And so I tried to instill that in Ted. I want to tell you just a short story about Ted because I think it's important for you to understand who he is. First of all, 1980, I was very involved. As you heard on the Religious Roundtable, I was very involved in the Reagan campaign. And our conversation around the dinner table was all about why we had to get rid of this socialist, progressive Jimmy Carter and replace him with a Christian constitutional conservative like Ronald Reagan. So my son got a dose of conservative politics from a Christian worldview every day for a year when he was nine years old. And when he turned 13, something happened that actually got, gave him a direction for the rest of his life. We introduced him to an organization called the Free Enterprise Institute. So now my son is 13, and he's reading Adam Smith, and Von Mises, and, and, and John Locke, and Hayek, and Bastiak, and Montesquieu, and Milton Friedman, and the Federalist Papers, and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Then this organization creates a group of five kids. They call them the Constitutional Corroborators. That was one of those five. They hired a memory expert, and they taught those five kids to memorize the entire U.S. Constitution. For the next five year, four years, for the next four years, all through high school, they traveled throughout the state of Texas. They would go to luncheon meetings, typically Rotary Clubs. They would set five easels in the front of the room, and while people were having lunch, they would write the Constitution by memory on those easels and then proceed after lunch to give a half-hour patriotic speech on free market economics and the Constitution. During the next four years, my son Ted gave approximately 80 speeches on free market economics and the Constitution. Before my son left high school, he was passionate about the Constitution. He was passionate about the declaration, about free markets, about limited government, about the rule of law. And that passion became like firing his bones. And let me tell you the reason I know my son Ted Cruz will not compromise his principles in Washington is that fire is as alive today as it was over 30 years ago. Now, you know, we've, you've probably heard candidates tell you, oh, you need someone who has management experience. Let me tell you something, America is in crisis. We do not need crisis management, we need crisis resolution, and that requires a leader and a fighter with a proven record and a vision for America. And I'll tell you very quickly, I'll tell you as we look at that stage on the presidential debates, we have a lot of good candidates. However, I believe without any doubt that we have one candidate that stands head and shoulders above all those others. And that candidate is Ted Cruz, and I'll tell you why. Because Ted Cruz has been at the forefront of fighting for every battle that is important for America. Whether it is fighting for our First Amendment rights of freedom of speech and freedom of religion, he's been fighting those battles for the last 20 years. My son was instrumental in case after case after case fighting for religious liberty at the Supreme Court. For five and a half years at the Supreme Court, as Solicitor General of Texas, he tried nine cases at the Supreme Court. 
most of those dealing with religious liberty and with U.S. sovereignty. Whether it is fighting for our Second Amendment rights to keep and bear arms, let me tell you, not only was he instrumental in the Heller victory, but when we had the Newtown massacre, Republicans were in the minority. All the Republican leadership was saying, gun control is inevitable. My son Ted was a member of the minority in the Judiciary Committee. As a member of the minority, he challenged Diane Feinstein, who was the one passed with all the bills for gun control. And he made such a case in that committee that Diane Feinstein began screaming, I am not a sixth grader, and nothing passed on gun control. Ted Cruz accomplished that as a member of the minority party in committee. That was a huge victory. As a matter of fact, the, IR, the NRA gave Ted the highest award they gave as the strongest defender of the Second Amendment. Whether he's fighting for the Fourth Amendment rights or the Ninth and Tenth Amendment rights to limit the federal government to those 18 powers described in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, the enumerated powers of Congress, and if it's not there, the federal government's got no business to be involved in. My son Ted Cruz is going to Washington to cut down the size, power, and scope of the federal government and restrict it to those 18 powers. My son Ted just announced this last week, a tax plan reducing the tax field to just a flat 10% tax with a $36,000 exception for a family of four. Now let me share something with you. We heard a few minutes ago talk about the fair tax. And I'll tell you what, I love the fair tax. A tax on consumption sounds great, but uh, let me ask you to look around the world. There are several countries that have consumption tax. For example, Mexico. They have a 15% consumption tax. But you know what? They also have an income tax. For a fair tax to work, you must repeal the 16th Amendment before because politicians in Washington will put it on top of the income tax. So you must repeal the 16th Amendment in order to have a fair tax. Because, as I say, look at other countries like Australia. I think England has the same thing. I know Mexico has it. It's a 15% consumption tax. So if you do not repeal the 16th Amendment, you will have a consumption tax in addition to an income tax. Now, what happens with taxes is we need to reduce them to the minimum so we can have more money in the pockets of every individual so they can use that money to invest it in opportunity, in creating new jobs. Ted's tax plan reduces for individuals to one flat tax at 10%. As I said, for a family of four, there's a $36,000 deduction. Every decile, every group pays less taxes. And it repeals the payroll tax, which is the biggest tax that individuals pay, to get, pay today. It repeals the death tax. It repeals the corporate tax. There is a business tax flat at 16%. And guess what? If you export that, uh, what you export is not subject to that 16%, so that makes you more competitive overseas. But what is imported, it is subject to that 16%. So actually, it levels the playing field. It makes it more, more attractive for goods and services from the United States to be exported to other, country, other countries. This tax does not increase the debt. As a matter of fact, it creates, over 10 years, 4.9 million jobs, it actually keeps more money in the pockets of people. At the same time, there is no agency that has destroyed the, our economy more than the EPA. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of regulations that are stifling small businesses. If you cut down taxes and regulations, you allow the American people to do what they do best, and that is with Innovation, you release, unleash free enterprise to create millions and millions of jobs in small businesses which create 
40% of all jobs in America. Now, again, a little while ago, uh, we heard about the challenges with diseases, the challenges that we have with, with the medical problems, and then we heard an expert opinion for the cures that have been encountered that are not being released to the public because the obstacle is, again, another regulatory agency, and that's the FDA. And my son, just this past week, submitted a, bill, a bill to precisely try to cut down that bureaucracy that is keeping drugs that are saving lives in Europe from being approved here for more than 10 who knows how many years because of all the bureaucracy of the FDA. So that there is a way to do this. But the way to do this is not to get the government involved in doing research. Research needs to be done by private enterprise. The government cannot do anything efficiently. Let me tell you, you know what the definition of a camel is? It's a horse put together by a committee. And that's the way the, government, the federal government works. Anything the federal government gets involved in is going to have all kinds of waste. So we don't need more federal agencies. We don't need any more federal programs. We need for the federal government to get out of the way. If you go back to the time of the framers, it was the colonies that created the federal government. So the states created the federal government for the limited purpose of doing those things that were better done in a consolidated way. Primarily, take care of national defense. That was at the top of the list. And then those were restricted then in Article 1, Section 8 to only 18 powers. But we have an out of control government that is in every area of our lives. I'll just challenge you to read Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. The word education is not there. That means all this garbage with common core just trying to brainwash our kids. And it's all about control. It's not about testing. It's not about standards. It's about control of the government upon our children. Education is not in Article 1, Section 8. The Department of Education is unconstitutional. The word environment is not in Article 1, Section 8 either. The EPA is unconstitutional. We don't need the federal government regulating us. Do you know that on the Clean Water Act today, they are wanting to regulate a puddle in your backyard because they, it may be polluted and they, it may run off and touch your neighbors. So now even a puddle in your backyard is going to be regulated by the EPA. This is crazy. We don't need more government like Reagan said. Government is not the solution. Government is the problem. So we need a man that has fought all his life and goes to Washington to make Washington less relevant, not more relevant, and to leave all those powers to the states or to the local level. I'll tell you what. If you want to see a difference, you look at the only person in Washington that called not only for defunding, but prosecuting Planned Parenthood for their criminal behavior. That was only one man. That was Ted Cruz. Whether you want to look at someone who has been at the forefront, at the forefront of trying to push back on this horrible Iran deal. You see, this Iran deal is the opposite of what Obama and Kerry said. They said it's either this deal or war. Well, it is the opposite. This deal guarantees war. Because it guarantees that Iran will get a bomb, and they get a bomb, they will use it. Number two, it guarantees that they will continue to build ICBMs. You only need ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, for one reason, to bomb America. You don't need them to bomb Israel. Any little old rocket will do that. This is crazy. This is treason. Obama and Kerry have violated their oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. They have violated their oath of office. And I'll tell you, we need a leader 
that will have the guts to say on day one of a President Ted Cruz, all those multitude of executive orders, unconstitutional, unlawful executive orders pushed forth by Obama will be repealed day one by a President Cruz with one executive order. Whether it is to get rid of all the regulations, my son already pushed forth a bill, which of course Obama would not sign, saying that any regulation of the APA that affects negatively even one job or has a negative impact on the economy would have to be approved by Congress. Of course, they killed it. Because the problem is not just the Democrats. Ted Cruz is running against the Washington cartel, corrupt career politicians in both parties. And he's the only one that has had the integrity and the strength to come out against both parties and said, I am running against the corruption in Washington. You need a leader and a fighter. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, let's also look at viability. Because, unfortunately, Republican national politics are very expensive. Do you know who was the candidate that raised the most money the first quarter in June 30th? It wasn't Jeb Bush, it was Ted Cruz. Raised $14.3 million by June 30th. Came from over 175,000 donations. Average donation, $81, pure grassroots. Second highest was Jeb Bush, raised $11 million. Average donation, over $900. That translates on about 12,000 dollars. 12,000 versus 175,000. Let's drill down of those numbers. Of those 175,000 donations of Ted Cruz, over 95% of them were $100 or less. In the case of Jeb Bush, less than 3% were $200 or less. As of right now, the candidate with the most money in the bank is Ted Cruz, with $13.5 million in the bank today. Not only that, Ted Cruz has 6,000 donors, which are called the sustainers. They're covering 100% of the overhead of the campaign nationally. Not only that, Ted Cruz has, in the first four states, is the only candidate that has a county chair in every county in the first four states. In addition, Ted Cruz has an organization, not only in the first four states, not only in the dozen states that are playing on March 1, but has an organization in about 30 states. We announced this week, we have over 77,000 volunteers at Ted Cruz. We have a grassroots army. We have a coalition of pastors, people of faith, all across America, locking arms against for, for Ted Cruz. Let me tell you what happened last week. Last Thursday, a week ago, last Thursday in New Hampshire, all the grassroots groups, Tea Parties, 912s, grassroots groups, got together into a caucus. And they said, we are going to have a caucus, and we will all endorse the person who wins the caucus. Ted won that caucus by 72%. As of today, of 40 Tea Parties in that group, 37 have already endorsed Ted Cruz. That was in New Hampshire. The next day, in North Carolina, the same thing happened. Ted Cruz won by 51%. And the largest Tea Party in North Carolina has already endorsed the Asheville Tea Party. The next day on Saturday, Arkansas had another straw poll. All the Tea Parties in a coalition in Arkansas, Ted Cruz won by 67%. A couple of weeks before, Freedom Works, which is a libertarian group, had a, a grass, uh, grassroots uh, straw poll. Ted Cruz won by an overwhelming majority. As a matter of fact, in New Hampshire, just about a week and a half ago, there was a Libertarian National Convention. Ted Cruz got split the vote almost 50-50 with Rand Paul, who should have won basically 100%. That's his crowd. And Ted Cruz just about split it. But let me tell you another news that are huge news. 
as of June 30th, the super PAC for Ted Cruz had $38 million in the bank. The only one who had more money in, in a super PAC is Jeb Bush. But let me tell you some of the news you may not know. David Barton, one of the most respected evangelicals in America, is now running Ted Cruz Super PAC. So I'll tell you, we have the grassroots, we have the evangelical coalition, we have the organization, and we have the money to go the wrong course, the, the whole course. But more than that, we have a leader and a fighter with a proven record and a vision for America. I'll tell you what, if you go to TedCruz.org, you won't find an issues page. Because it is easy for candidates to tell you, this is what I am going to do. But you got to stop listening to the rhetoric and start looking at the record. Stop listening to what they say. Start looking at what they do and what they have done. Jesus put it this way, ye shall know them by their fruits. For example, in that stage, everybody tells you they're against Common Core. But I know several of them that have been in the tank for Common Core for years. They all tell you they are against amnesty. I know some of them that have been promoting amnesty for years. So don't listen to what they say. Look at what they do. Ted Cruz does not have an issues page on his campaign. What he has instead is a proven record page. You can click on it, and it has a series of bullet points. You can click on any one of the bullet points, and it gives you line for line for line how he has fought for each and every one of those issues. So I am asking you today, there is nothing more than the Republican establishment would want. And let me tell you something. If the Republican, if, if establishment politician gets the nomination, Hillary Clinton will be the next president of the United States. Because the millions of constitutional conservatives that stayed home in 2008 and 2012 will stay home in 2016. So we must make sure we stay, we, we elect in the primaries, in the caucus, a constitutional conservative that stands for the Constitution, for the rule of law, for limited government, for separation of powers. And I'll tell you what, nothing more than those establishment candidates will want that for evangelicals, for grassroots conservatives, from constitutional conservatives to split. If we split, we lose. Look at the candidate that has got the vision for America, the record, and the organization and the money to go the whole. That man is Ted Cruz. So what I'm asking you today is to lock arms. Let us all unite together around that one candidate that can put together the Reagan coalition again and make America again that shining city on a hill. And that candidate is Ted Cruz. I'm going to ask you to endorse Ted Cruz today for president of the United States. Together, we will take America back to the glory of God. Thank you. God bless you. Do I have time for some questions? Uh, it looks like we have a little time for a couple of questions, if anybody. Yes, sir. What, how has that affected uh, your son's campaign contributions? And let me tell you something. In the next 22 hours, we got over a million one hundred thousand dollars coming to TedCruz.org. As a matter of fact, in the first few hours, we had seven hundred thousand dollars come just that evening. And in 22 hours, it well surpassed one million dollars. We are seeing, as a matter of fact, you know, I was I watched Ted Cruz's uh, Facebook page every day. It had been growing by about a thousand people a day since the debate is growing at about five thousand people a day, and he's got over a million and a half people in his Facebook. Twitter, Twitter went wild the night of the debate, and most of the chatter on Twitter was about Ted Cruz. When you have someone like Frank Luntz tell you that Ted Cruz was a clear winner at the debate, at, at that, uh, at that uh, focus group that Frank Luntz was at here in Iowa, there were six people that switched to Ted Cruz after that debate. As a matter of fact, Frank Luntz said that 
statement by Ted hit 98% in his recording. It's never happened since he's been doing this. The grassroots results are overwhelming. Overwhelming. This is becoming a tsunami. And I'm asking you, become a part. This is a movement. It's become a conservative movement that is going to become another Reagan revolution. This is going to become the Cruz revolution. Join us. Together, we will take America back. I'll take one more question. Uh, yes. Uh, uh-huh. Uh, one thing that this uh, administration has cut, which many of us are distressed about, is the military, the military budget, and um, also has changed the way the military does business in terms of the um, uh, engagement, rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. What would uh, President Cruz do to fix that? Well, let me say this. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Let me say this. We have a debt to the men and women that have put their lives in, on the line to defend this country. Not only do we have a debt to make sure that the veterans get, the, you know, get given consideration instead of what we have today. We have had veterans dying because of denied care by the VA hospitals. That's a travesty. But beyond that, Ted Cruz, just like Ronald Reagan, believes in peace through strength. You know, when Ronald Reagan was asked, what is your foreign policy? He said, very simple, we win, they lose. That's it. When Ted was, was saying, what do you intend to do with ISIS? His answer was very simple, we kill them all. We can't fight a limited war. You know, Ted Cruz was on the Judiciary Committee talking to one of these puppet generals that Obama has put in power because he has forced to retire or fire all the generals that were strong on the military. And he's got all these puppet generals, and he was asking one of these puppet generals, what do we have to do to destroy ISIS in 90 days? This general said, well, it is impossible to destroy ISIS in 90 days. All we can do is just manage them. And so Ted said, all right, tell me how long will it take to totally destroy ISIS? And this general said, it is impossible to destroy them. No matter how long the time, all we can do is try to contain them. That is totally unacceptable, and that's what my son said. We cannot fight a limited war. If you go to war, you go to war to win, because if you don't go to win, if you find a limited war, we are putting our men and women in uniform at risk by not providing all the resources to go out there, do the job, and get out. And I'll tell you what, my son has committed. He's president. America will again have the strongest military in the world, and the rules of engagement will change. Not, not like now. Now, if a soldier is shot at, they got to call and ask permission to shoot back at them. That is absolutely crazy. And you have military uh, personnel in a base that cannot even carry a weapon. That's why we've had the massacres we've had. Even in the schools. You know, let me tell you something. All of these people that are committing these massacres are a bunch of cowards. They will only go in gun-free zones. You remember that massacre at that theater? There were seven theaters in the area. That theater was the only one that had a sign in the front. This is a gun-free zone. Pastor Cruz, we have one more question for you. Yes. Yes. Thank you for teaching your son about Jesus Christ. Thank you. I have a couple of comments and their questions. One is, you can't do away with Social Security. People will not put aside on their own money particularly in the future. Secondly, your son signed up for Obamacare. No, he did not. No, he did not. He did no. that on the floor. He mentioned it. He did he not. Let me say this. What he said was this. He said, uh, let, me, let me take the questions one at a time. Number one, 
my son has never advocating getting rid of Social Security. What he said is this, Social Security, the way it is today, will become unsolvable because the government has stolen the money from Social Security. So he has said, we need to do something to make Social Security strong and keep it strong forever. So, would you allow me to answer the question, please? Let me let me allow let me let me let me try to answer the question. We just have time for an answer. We can't have a debate. All right. When Social Security, when Social Security was instituted, the average age was 62 years. That was the age of the, today is 78, 80 years old. So we have less and less people trying to pay for Social Security. It is insolvable on the today's standard. So there are a couple of things that have to be done. Number one, for people that are close to Social Security, we cannot change anything because we made a commitment for those people. But for people that are, say, in their low 40s to middle 40s, those people, if something does not change, Social Security will not be around by the time it becomes 65. So for those people, we have to start gradually increasing the age of retirement. It, Social Security is not sustainable if we keep it at 65 for those people that will achieve res retirement, say, in 20 years. The other thing is this. He has said, and here's this thing, optionally, optionally, those people have the opportunity to put part of their money instead of on Social Security, on a private savings account that they can not only manage, but when they die, their heirs inherit that money, not the government keeps it, it goes to their heirs. It becomes a hard asset. The other thing that you can do is instead of having Social Security increase at 1% above inflation, you tag it to inflation, just to inflation, not inflation force one. If you do that, Social Security becomes solvable. Now, the second part of the equation had to do with Obamacare. What my son said is this. Let's take it as a matter of principle. My son was under his wife's policy. His wife left her job in order to come full time on the campaign. So in other words, Obamacare, and this is something that both the Republicans and the Democrats were in cahoots with doing it. They went to Obama and they said, we want an exemption. There is an exemption for Congress not to be on Obamacare. They have a Cadillac plan that the government provides. My son said, I will not take something that the American people have no access to it. If I have to, I would rather go on Obamacare just like everybody in the population instead of taking that Cadillac plan that only members of Congress can have. Since then, he has bought into a private insurance. It's not Obamacare, and it's not the Cadillac plan from the government. I'm out of time. Thank you. God bless you. God bless America.